thank you so much for agreeing to do this for us. Um, I know it's going to save us so much time. I went through this presentation seven, how many years ago was it? Seven, five? Yeah, it's been a while now. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and, and all those things stuck with me. Um, and Justin, you guys is probably the smartest person I've ever met. Um, but he's also <laughs> the most humble. Like he will, he just will always tell you how awesome you are. So he's a good person to have in your corner. Um, he's very approachable and uh, no question is a stupid question. So with that. I'll yeah, have... absolutely not. Well, thanks so much. That's, wow, that's uh, quite the intro. Um, yeah, so this is a talk. I've done this kind of once before. It was, uh, we used to do these talks. They're called lunchbox lectures, kind of just like come up with a random topic at lunchtime and talk about it. And I thought, eh, you know, what's one that I could do? And, you know, just having worked, I'm a software developer by, by trade and, um, you know, having worked with computers so much, I just kind of like gained this little list of things that I started to do over time to, you know, make work more efficient. And I thought, you know, that a lot of them could be, you know, not necessarily specific to software development in any way. So useful to a, a wire variety. So, so I put together this talk and this will be the second time I give it. So uh, it sounded like, you know, Steph found it useful. So I hope you guys find it useful as well. Um, all right. So yeah, just a little bit about myself. I'm a, a freelance software developer. Uh, I do a pretty wide range of stuff, everything from sort of, you know, straightforward websites to mobile app development, done some systems development. So uh, I'm pretty lucky I get to work on a, you know, large variety of projects. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Steph a couple of times and I hope that trend continues. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so yeah so why you know why do we care about this talk well you know it's the old adage you know time equals money um but you know i sort of asked myself well how much time equals how much money um so i put together it's like okay you know how much time do you think you could save you know you know over the course of one day and i thought 15 minutes was a nice kind of round figure um, and then calculating that out to sort of, you know, how many average work days do you have in a year, you know, how many, you know, what does that time all equal up to? So it adds up to about three days. Um, so, you know, by sort of being more efficient, we can get ourselves another long weekend in a year, which, uh, which is nice. Um, so, um, what is the, you know, so the, everything I'm going to go over, I'm going to go over a few sort of a few different areas um, where, you know, you can kind of make things more efficient with how you're using the computer. Um, but they all kind of follow one theme in that sort of context switching uh, is, uh, is kind of the um, anti of productivity. Uh, I'm sure you guys are all aware of this, but um, so yeah, that's kind of the theme. And there's different types of context switching now, especially now that, you know, we communicate on, you know, more than one device. It's not just our computer. We're using our phone. You know, you know, most of us probably have multiple computers. Um, you know, we use, you know, all these apps. So there's different types of context switching and they're kind of more, some are more disruptive than others. So I kind of came up with this scale. Um, and a lot of what you see in this talk is to kind of limit you know, the expensive type of context switching. So the, you know, switching inputs, so going from like your computer to your mouse, it's context switch, um, but you know, it's a relatively non-invasive one. Um, so, you know, if we do have to context switch, we want to, we, you know, ideally would keep it just to switching, you know, inputs on, you know, on one, on one device. Um, switching apps is a different type of context switch and can actually be, I guess, more disruptive because, you know, once you're kind of locked into either your email or maybe you're in your web browser, switching, you know, apps kind of gives us, um, you know, we kind of we have to reset when we do that. So, um, you know, ideally, if you're not switching apps, that would be better. Um, and then switching devices is kind of the most expensive one. It really kind of takes you out of the mode that you're used to on your computer or if you're working on your phone, you have to switch your computer. Um, so switching devices is kind of the most, I guess, expensive type of context switch. So that's the one we kind of want to avoid the most. Um, so with that, I'll sort of just start kind of jumping into um, some of the things you can do to, to try to limit those types of context switch. Um, so first we'll just go over a couple of kind of simple um, 
things you can do with the keyboard to help you navigate between applications. So this is nice because it avoids you having to constantly go from your keyboard to your mouse. Um, you know, on a, most of you guys are probably on Apple computers. So the transition is pretty good, you know, with the trackpad, but you know, if you're using a, you know, a, like a mouse that's physically separated, then, you know, it, it, it it's more, um, I guess less seamless, but, um, but these, these can be good when you get fast with them. So you guys probably all know these too. So, um, you know, if you do, I apologize. Um, so alt tab or command tab helps you, you know, switch between applications. So if you, do you see the pop-up is a pop-up making it through the video? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, this can be a, a good way to, to, uh, you know, go through your, your different apps that you're using. Um, and it's kind of context sensitive. So let's say I want to go between my email and my browser. So once I switch to those two, the other one is always the next in the list. So if I'm switching back forth really quickly, I just have to do it once. I don't have to activate it and then kind of look for the app. I kind of always know it's the last one. So that's nice for the case where you're switching between two apps sort of, you know, very quickly. Um, and then, so, you know, and then, you know, command tab goes one way. And then if you do command shift tab, it goes the other way. So depending on where you are, you might want to reverse. Um, so that's uh, command tab to switch between apps. Um, switching between windows and apps, this might be maybe a, a lesser known one, but um, most applications on a Mac support the command uh, tilde um, or backtick uh, to switch between windows. So let's say in my web browser, right now I have tabs, but let's say I prefer windows instead of tabs. So let me open up a couple of the browser tabs here. Um, I'll go to you know different sites on each one. So if I command tilde, I can just cycle in with, so between them. So if I'm, you know, going between two, let's say, you know, browser, cause I'm on two different web pages or something, you know, I can command tick to get between them rather than, you know, have to go to my menu and, you know, switch between them like this, or, you know, move one around to get to the other one. So command back tick helps with that. Um, and then the sort of third one I'll do is is more specific to the browser, but much, a lot of other applications do this as well. Anything that supports the notion of tabs will usually let you switch between the tabs by using command and a number. So here I have, you know, five tabs. So if I want to go to tab four, I just command four and that switches me to that tab. Or if I want to go back to the first one, I command, command one, command two, three, four, five. So once you kind of get good at this, it's just a more efficient way to switch through tabs rather than taking your mouse and, you know, navigating it to the tab. It's a little bit faster to just do the, do the keystroke, especially if your hands are already on the keyboard typing. Um, and like I said, other apps do this. So um, here's an application I use for email. And um, as you can see, I have multiple email accounts, probably the same way all of you guys do. So same sort of thing. If I want to switch between, you know, all my emails, I can do that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like what I call like app navigation, sort of getting between all your apps and then within the application, sort of navigating the different windows or tabs you might have. Um, if there's any questions, please just cut me off and, and ask them now and we can focus in on the topic. Um, you guys want to take a second and practice? <laughs> I, think, I think like for Ali, I think that, um, command tab is gonna save you probably like 30 or 40 minutes a day. Um, like just with the amount of switching around you have to do on your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got them all screenshotted. So I'll try them after the okay. presentation. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay, next we'll go into like launching apps. So um, you guys, I don't know if how many of you use a, an application launcher, but um, when I say, launcher, I mean things like your spotlight on a Mac. So, um, you know, it, you can find it in the upper hand corner. There's also like a command space you can use to applicate, um, to activate it. And so these are really nice to, you know, if I want to launch Chrome, you know, I just type in CEH and it, you know, it, it's going to find Chrome for me, um, which is nice. So that, you know, the alternative is, you know, maybe you have it in your dock. So you, again, you're switching from your keyboard to your mouse to go down to the dock find the application you might have. 
it gets really expensive if the application is not in your dock. Then you have to go into your applications, you know, through the finder and find the application you want. So um, much faster to just command space and type in, you know, the application or the first few letters of it. The nice thing about these things is it remembers your patterns. So um, if you're constantly launching your email or your web browser, um, you know, it, it, it learns that. So like when I type in S, I mean, you know, I use Slack. So, you know, Slack is the one I use the most. So that's the first one that comes up. So it really sort of makes, you know, makes it efficient. You can literally do it in two keystrokes. Um, so there's a couple of different ones you can use. Um, there's one that comes built in with Mac OS X called Spotlight. It's pretty useful, but it really just kind of does um, like applications. Uh, there are other ones out there that do a little bit more. Um, so I use one called Launch Bar and um, it works basically the same way. That's actually what you're seeing. It looks a lot like Spotlight. That's the one you're seeing here when I command space. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it does applications. I can launch Chrome or my mail or, you know, whatever else. There's a bunch of other actions it comes with. I don't use most of them, but there's a couple that I do use. One I find actually really useful is it's kind of got a built-in calculator. So like, if I just need to do some like quick math, I can do it, I can do it from my, so one, two, three, plus four, five. Um, so I actually find that one quite useful rather than going to do, like going into a calculator app or something like that again just trying to keep me sort of in context. Um, so once you get used to that one, it's, it's kind of useful. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit more about application launchers in the next step, because one of the things that launch bar, and there's this other free one called Alfred, which a lot of people like and is really good. Um, they integrate with other applications on your computer. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So. Um, the next thing I'll go over is uh, just getting good with like keyboard shortcuts is really one that can save you time. And as an example, Gmail is an application that has like a million shortcuts for everything. And it's one that you guys probably all use. Um, so in Gmail, you can, you can sort of navigate with the keyboard again, switching, going, preventing us from going from keyboard to mouse or, you know, between windows. So um, you can do it all with the keyboard. So I've listed a few of the keyboard shortcuts here. And so I'll just go into Gmail. Um, a quick, uh, a quick little kind of like side note here is, um, if, I don't know what you guys use to read your Gmail. A lot of people just use the web browser. Um, you can get applications like this. This one's called Mailplane. So as you can see, it's, it's like a, it's a dedicated app on the computer. Um, so to get to my Gmail, I just, you know, alt tab over to an application rather than alt tabbing to Chrome and then going to a tab that has Gmail on it. So again, something that can kind of save you a second or two. Um, and this one's nice because it's, it's exactly Gmail just in an application. Um, so I guess, you know, it, it, to, to, for it to, I guess resonate with you, you need to like the Gmail web application, which not everyone does. Like someone, you know, others prefer more of like a, a, an Apple mail style interface, which is great. Um, one of the nice things about Gmail though, is it has all these, these, uh, these keyboard shortcuts that you can really master to, to make things really efficient. So let's say, you know, I'm starting my day, you know, and just like most of you, you probably have a pretty full inbox of stuff to go through. So, you know, the first thing you're going to do is kind of go through and just kind of say, okay, like, here's an email. Do I need to care about this now? You know, okay, archive it, no, use it, whatever. So, so you can, get, it, once you get good at the keyboard shortcuts, you can really make this efficient. So here, I'm just going to go through my inbox and kind of, kind of clear it out. So, um, so I hit enter on to get into this one email. It's like, oh, okay, I probably need to care about this one. So I'm just going to go to the next email in my list. Um, okay, this one, yeah, okay, I need to care about that one, so I'm going to go back, and I'm doing this all with my keyboard, so now, here's one, ah, okay, this one I don't care about, so I'm just going to archive it right away, go to the next one, archive it. How did you, are, what one. are you, how are you doing that, Justin? Sorry. Yeah, so, sorry, I'll, yeah, let me back up here, um, so, so I'm, so I'll go back to the slide, because they're listed on the slide, so a few of the keys are used for navigation, so, like, J and K move you upside, like, up and down. Um, which is nice because they're right next to each other on the keyboard. So it, do it I have to really hit fast to do command that. and J? 
you know what you have to turn on shortcuts sorry i should have um, mentioned that you might not have shortcuts on your in your gmail so if you go in your gmail settings oh, here yeah. um somewhere on here i think you turn on keyboard shortcuts yeah keyboard shortcuts on and off so once you turn them on then you can start to use your keyboard to to navigate i think people some people, if you don't, if you turn them on and you're not aware of them, they kind of get confusing because like you're typing into maybe an email box and they start to jump you around weirdly if you're not in the right spot. But um, yeah, so um, so yeah, so J and K sort of move me between conversations. So now I'm just moving up and down in my inbox. You know, so this is nice. I you know I just click on the first one and I can go down to the next one without having to pop back out. Sorry, I'm not using them properly. Um, and then one thing, you know, you end up doing a lot is like you read the email quickly and then you archive it. So um, E, when you're in a conversation, does that. So I'm like using this one, I can just archive it by just pressing the E key and that's just automatically going to move me to the next one. Or, you know, if you're big on like snoozing emails, which I like to do because I like to keep a nice empty inbox, you can do that from here too with a keyboard shortcut. And, you know, I just think. What was the shortcut for the snooze? B, just the, the letter B, yeah. And then you can go down and, okay, I'll sneeze that till next week. Um, so, and th there's, a, there's a million of them. So if you go to like Gmail keyboard shortcuts, you can really do everything with a shortcut. Cool. Um, so th this, so yeah, so these, this is actually a really, a really big time saver if you're using, you know, Gmail every morning or every day, you probably use it, you know, all throughout the day. So, um, yeah, here's a good, pretty good yep. reference of them. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff there. Awesome. Um, okay, let's go back to, okay. So that's, so yeah, so just, and, you know, other applications, Apple Mail has its own set of shortcuts, um, you know, just taking the time to sort of learn them, um, you know, can really be a sort of productivity booster. Uh, so on the password manager, so, um, Password managers, uh, I don't know, things like 1Password, LastPass, um, there's a few of them out on the market. Um, I don't know if, if, if you guys use one, but um, they're really good for a couple different reasons. I mean, one is they, they kind of improve your security um, by, uh, you know, making your password secure, letting you share them so that you don't have, like share them with team uh, uh, colleagues so you don't have to send them over email or text which you know it, it is a way that passwords can leak out um, but they also offer like convenience so going back to the uh, application launcher um, one thing that these launchers uh, that launch bar application that I showed you does is it integrates with one password it integrates with LastPass as well so what this does one is password if that helps Okay, cool. Yeah, I, that's that's what I'll show as well. So one thing they do is, um, so let's say I want to log into, let's just pull up my AWS account. So I've got my AWS um, account that I log into, you know, usually at least once a day. Um, and, you know, I can go to the application here and, you know, and then I can say, okay, you know, go and log me in. It's going to go in, fill out the, um, you know, fill out the username and password it used to log you in and like submit the form. So it used to be really efficient, all kind of one thing, but um, later versions of Mac don't do that anymore. It's like a security thing. They can't like, for whatever reason, can't submit the button anymore, but you can just, you know, enter and, and submit the form and then you're in your application. So that's faster than, you know, um, going to the site and then, you know, say, okay, what password am I using for this? Especially if you're using a different password for every site, which you should. Anyways, so, um, but what, uh, so here, let me sign out. So one of the things the application launchers do is they integrate with all your one, with your one password database. So if I type in dev, it comes up as an option here and I just enter and then it, oh, it didn't, uh, oh yeah, there it worked. It just switched windows weirdly. So it did that kind of like in, you know, again, just all from my keyboard. I didn't have to go into one password to do it. So. Um, so that I actually, I find that one of the biggest time savers, um, is to be able to do that right from launch bar. I don't know if spotlight does one password integration. I'm not sure. Um, it might, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's one of the, I'd say that's probably my favorite feature of, 
launch bar, the application launcher I use. Um, so it's password managers, um, clipboard managers. So um, do either, do you, is anyone use a clipboard manager? Does it, if you don't know what it is, that's fine. So, you know, everyone knows about um, you know, using the clipboard, you, you know, you need to copy, let's say an email address, you come and see it, and then you go into another window and you paste it. Um, and let's say, you know, then I need to copy another one and I go in and paste it. And it's like, okay, now I'm switching between a lot of things here. And if it's switching between applications, it's more expensive. So there's a million of these clipboard managers, actually launch bar comes with one, which is another reason why I like it. So using a keystroke, I can pull up my entire keyboard history. Um, so now I don't have to actually go back between applications and copy and paste stuff. Um, what I can do is I can just copy them all at once. So let's say I want to go in here, I'll copy these three, and then switch to this tab, and then just pull them out of my history. Like that. So rather than go between applications and copy and paste one at a time, I can kind of do them in batch. Now, you know, with the three email addresses, it probably doesn't make a huge difference, but you know, if you're copying like 10 things, um, you know, constantly switching back between those windows, you know, ends up taking time. The night, the other nice thing about it is like, you know, you go and do your, you go and do something else, you know, you're copy and pasting other stuff. It's like, oh, okay. It's like, mm, I copied that password or copied that email address, you know, it's in this list. So if I search for chain, you know, it's in that list already. Um, so yeah, so what I, with one password, what I end up using it a lot for is you know, I've copied a password that I've used somewhere. And then, you know, it's, it's in my clipboard history rather than go back into one password to get it. Um, you know, I can just pull it out of my clipboard history. So um, again, another, another time saver. Uh, okay, what's next? Uh, messaging. So we all do a lot of messaging, I'm sure. Um, so going back to the sort of different levels of context switching, switching between your computer and your device is probably the most disruptive. You know, you're completely going out of the zone of whatever you were doing to respond to a text, usually is what you're doing. Um, if you use iMessage, if you're on an Apple device, Android messages, if you have an Android phone, or, you know, a lot of people use WhatsApp, all these things have apps that you can run on your computer. So uh, I have a Android messages, so I have an Android phone. So I've got all my messages right here um, on, my, on my computer. So, you know, someone texts me, um, you know, I get a little notification and I can respond right here. Now, and you know, a couple of the reasons why this saves us time is, you know, typically we're better at typing than typing on a keyboard than typing on your phone. I don't know. Some people are really amazingly fast at typing on phones. I'm not. I'm terrible. Um, so this is a huge time saver for me because, you know, I can just type messages right here. So if I wanted to text Steph, you know. That would have taken me probably like a minute to type on my phone. So, <laughs> um, so again, so having the app on your computer, you know, allows you to switch sort of the, you know, the price of switching from your computer to your device. So, um, so those are nice. Um, Slack. So you guys don't use Slack. Um, I, I, I've kind of done a couple of, another talk I do is about Slack. I'm a pretty big proponent of it. I use it on a lot of, you know, uh, teams that I work on. Um, and it, I included in this talk because it, it can actually be like a real time saver productivity booster. So just a quick intro to Slack, like the idea behind Slack is it's really meant to be like a sort of central hub for all communication on your team. Um, it has all the features you'd expect in sort of like a, you know, a team communication platform. You can do text, voice, video, screen share, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it's really nice using it like sort of on the go. It's got re this really seamless like integration with your phone. So it's like you're in the office communicating with your team. Um, you know, you're getting all these notifications or you're chatting on Slack and then, you, you know, you leave your computer and it kind of knows when you're idle on the computer and, and then starts forwarding stuff to your phone. Uh, so it's nice. Um, but one of the things that it, it's good is it gives you kind of like a single channel to listen to. So, um, you know, 
at my work, you know, we use Hangouts for meetings, you know, um, for, you know, as a software developer, I use a system called GitHub a lot to, you know, watch uh, code changes that other developers are doing. Um, we use a bug tracking system named Jira. Um, you know, we use Asana for project management stuff. So all these systems have their own notifications. So I'm listening to like four sets of notifications, you know, they're all coming into my inbox and they're all intermingled with everything else. Well, Slack has integrations for all these things. So the way we set these up is that they, we just feed them all into Slack. So really when I go to my Slack, um, I can kind of show you what it looks like if I pull it up here. Um, Justin, you know, how we does that integrate with Basecamp? It's got a plugin for Basecamp too. I, I've never really used Basecamp too much, but I'm sure that like, you know, you, you probably get notifications in Basecamp. So what it would do is it would like send them to Slack. So you'd be, you know, so in Slack, you have these different channels. So like, for instance, we have one called um, GitHub, which is for code stuff. Jira is our bug tracking one. And then we've got a bunch of other random ones. Like, um, so you could set up like a channel or, you know, you can have general channels or whatever. So basically you just kind of feed the notifications right into here. Um, so like, for instance, here's a channel that has all our bug track bug tracker notifications. So um, when someone creates a bug or, you know, responds to it, you know, a comments on a bug or something like that, it just comes into here. Um, I don't have to go and get it out of my email. So, um, and it would do the same for like Basecamp. Like if someone commented on a, on a doc, uh, document or something like that, I imagine it, you know, it would send a notification here. So again, the idea is it kind of gives you one sort of hub for everything. Um, again, to not have to switch between applications. And when thinking about productivity, it's like, okay, we've got all these things we're listening to. Like, that's kind of like anti-productivity. It's like, just like, okay, I'm getting a notification from this system. Now I'm getting another one from here. Having one sort of, having it all centralized, you can use like a do not disturb feature. So Slack makes it easy to like say, basically just don't bug me about anything for the next hour or whatever. That's um, what Haley so wants. <laughs> yeah. And so if you fed sort of all your like offices communication, like all the applications that send notifications, so like Basecamp and whatever, you know, Google Docs, whatever you're using, um, you know, you can kind of turn them all off at once, which is nice. Um, and that lets you kind of like block out hours of time. It's like, you know what, now I'm just going to focus on writing this document. I don't want to be bothered for the next hour. Um, and again, that can be a huge productivity booster. I mean, one of the biggest ones really, if you're, you know, able to shut all that stuff, other stuff off, I'm really bad at it. So, you know, I'm <laughs> here kind of preaching about it, but, uh, yeah, but, but I know people that use it and they, they say it makes a huge difference. So, so something to consider I, I, a lot of teams use Slack. There's other ones. Microsoft teams is becoming pretty popular. Um, so, uh, yeah. But all, all sort of the same thing. The idea is to take all the different applications you're using, kind of feed them into Slack and use that as sort of your central communication hub. Um, the other thing with Slack I thought I would mention, um, because I think it, it really matters, is um, that one of the philosophies of Slack is to like make one-on-one -on -one communication not the norm, but the exception. So a lot of the sort of anti-patterns people fall into is like, okay, I need to talk to this one person about something. It's like, okay, I'm going to send them a private message and we're going to go over a bunch of stuff. And it's like, okay, I spent 15 minutes talking about this project with somebody. And then they realize, oh crap, okay, we need to bring this other person in. So it's like, okay, let's bring them into the conversation or even worse, you, you know, you'll, the manager will go and have another one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. So Slack really promotes sort of like global chat rooms, I guess, like for everyone on your team. Um, so that, you know, you can kind of passively follow communication, which can really help because, you know, let's say you were having that chat about this project with one other person, but you were doing it in like your public team channel. Well, the other team members could be, you know, sort of passively following along and it's like, oh, hey, you know, we need to bring this person into the conversation. Well, they've already kind of been following. So really they're kind of already up to speed. So that's something that a lot of people don't, don't do a lot of. Uh, I know a lot of the companies I work Again, they're just used to sort of like one-on-one -on -one messaging channels, like email and stuff like that. And so, you know, making this switch to just make, you know, just think about like, does this really need to be one-on-one? -on -one? You know, obviously there's times where it does, like maybe you're talking about something sensitive or you're talking behind one of your coworkers' backs or something like that, um, where, you know, you don't want it to be out in the open. But um, yeah, 
this can uh, this can help to kind of save everyone's time by just kind of sending the message once. Justin, does Slack have the option to just send private messages or no? Yeah, yeah, oh. it does. Yeah, so going back into Slack a little bit, you can send like, so there's direct messages with people and then there's these channels. So the channels are usually like where team members would hang out. So like every Slack has like a general channel, which everyone is kind of on. And then, you know, you can set them up however you want, but, you know, usually like, you know, different projects have like their own dedicated channel because you're talking about a single project. You know, and, and it's like, it makes sense to kind of have them in, in one channel. Um, you know, you have like a sort of random water cooler channel, like sort of people send random stuff or whatever. And then, yeah, you have all your direct messages down here. Perfect. So yeah, it does both. Um, yeah, it does video chat. So, you know, if you're in a direct message with somebody and you just want to fire up a video chat, it makes it really easy to do that. Um, and if you're using Hangouts or Zoom, you can start the Zoom chat right from Slack. So it's nice, you don't have to go into Zoom, set up a meeting and all that. It's just like one command in Slack. It's like, okay, start a Zoom call and boom, and it kind of does it all for you, which is nice. Um, um, and yeah, the Slack, uh, it actually comes with a free, the free plan is actually decent. Um, it doesn't have all the features of the paid plan, but um, you can get pretty far with the free plan just, um, Sort of if you're, you know, if, if if you're like a smaller team, um, once you get into being a bigger team and you want to start using more of the features, like I don't think it does, you can do video chat with the free plan, but you can only do like one person video chats. You can't do like a video chat room, um, stuff like that. So um, yeah, you can you can try it out for free um, at no cost and the free plan gets, gets you pretty far. Perfect. Um, so I only had one more thing to show, and this is kind of a more advanced one, um, but I thought I, I would show it just because it's one of the ones that really saves me sort of the most time. Um, it might be a bit programmer centric, but um, who knows, maybe, you know, if, if one person here latches onto it, then, you know, it's worth it. Um, so let's say, so the idea is multiple cursors. So let's say, Again, going back to this like list of emails, let's say I need to do like, okay, I've got this list of emails, but it's not like formatted the way I want it to be formatted. I need to, I want to dump this into like the BCC of a, of an email or something like that. So I need them all on one line. I need the cob separated. So, you know, what you would do is you, you know, you kind of navigate around your text editor and you, know, you go line by line. Okay. And you know, okay, now I need to put them all on one line. So let me do this. You know, a lot of keystrokes involved in that. So what this uh, editor called Sublime Text does and a few others do um, is they they have this idea of multiple cursors. So I can select a bunch of lines and create multiple cursors, like text cursors in the text editor. So that I can do stuff like all on one line. So let's say I want to do that comma separated thing and then put them all on one line. I did that in two keystrokes and now I just need to remove that and I've got what I needed in a lot less keystrokes. So again, with five lines, you know, probably not a huge deal, but you know, maybe you had a list of like a hundred or something like that. Um, that could be a real time saver. Um, it works with like copy and paste. So a lot of the things I end up doing with it is like, you know, I'm doing some HTML and I need to put all these emails into like HTML links. So I can select all the emails and just start kind of typing Oh, like yeah. that and now i've created you know an html list whereas you know doing that sort of line by line would have been more time consuming so again pretty advanced but um you know again it's just it's just a text editor and you know they're just all keyboard shortcuts so you know you just got to take the time to get used to it it's really one that um can save you a ton of time if you're doing a lot of like text editing or like email formatting or something like that um it took me a while to like kind of get the hang of it. But once I did, it was like one of those things was like, wow, this is like total life changer. Um, so that's about it. Um, any questions? Like I'm happy to chat about any of the things we went over or any other topics, any other questions you guys might have about productivity or just like kind of tech in general or. Um, I don't, I feel like I learned lots. I have lots of free stuff where I can go back yeah. and test everything. Cool. Uh, but maybe the other girls do. It's all very new for me. So it was great. Sure. 
very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, uh, this, this, uh, this talk is all online. It's just a URL you can go to. Um, Perfect. I'll, uh, I should have put, sorry, I should have put it in the talk, but I'll send that out to Steph to forward on to you guys. And then you can just, you can go and go to this URL and you can kind of loop through the slides if you want a refresher. Um, or yeah, there's like one slide you see, it's like, yeah, he talked about that, but like, I didn't quite get it, you know, just let me know. I can provide more of an explanation or, you know, something like that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, Haley, Sydney, do you guys have any questions? Um, oh, I'm good. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was a little late. No worries. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, hopefully that uh, yeah makes you guys a little bit more efficient on the day to day and gives you more time to go out. And I guess maybe not right now, but uh, <laughs> enjoy yourselves doing non work stuff. Um, yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks all right. so much. Nice to, yeah, nice to, yeah, nice to meet you. all you guys. Yeah. Well. Take care.